we're going to be reading three story time. We're going to be reading three stories from the Grimm's fairy tale. So let's start with the first one, shall we? Let's see. are all ready for this. We're going to have a nice, relaxing time. Our first story tonight is going to be Snow White and Rose Red. Let's begin. Rain is a bit loud. Okay, I'll turn it down a tiny bit. Hopefully that's a little bit better. Okay. Snow White and Rose Wet Red There was once a poor widow who lived in a lonely cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden where instead two rose trees, one of which She had two children who were like the two red rose trees, and one still slightly out loud. Okay, thank you for letting me know, guys. Appreciate it. All right, that should be better. She had two children who were like the two rose trees. One was called Snow White, and the other, Rose Red. They were as as good and happy as busy and cheerful as ever two children in the world could be. Only Snow, Snow White was more quiet and gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked better to run about in the meadows and fields, seeking flowers, catching butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her out with housework or read to her when there was nothing to do. The two children were so fond of another that they always held each other by the hand when they went out together. And when Snow White said, we will not leave each other, Rose Red answered, never so long as we live. And the mother would add, what one has she must share. They often ran about the forest alone, and gathered red berries, and no beasts did them any harm, but came close to them trustfully. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf out of their hands, the roe grazed by their side, the stag leapt merrily by them, and the birds, my phone has vibrate on. The birds sat still amongst the bows and sang whatever they knew. No mishap overtook them if they had stayed too late in the forest and night came on. They laid themselves down near one another among the moss and slept until morning came. And their mother knew this and did not worry on their account. Once they had spent the night in the wood, and the dawn had roused them, they saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress sitting near their bed. He got up and looked quite kindly at them, but said nothing, and went to the forest. And when they looked around, they found that they had been sleeping quite close to a precipice and would certainly have fallen into it in the darkness if they had only gone a few paces further. And their mother told them that it must have been an angel who watches over good children. Snow White and Rose White kept, kept their mother's little cottage so neat. It was a pleasure to look inside it. In the summer, Rose Red which 
was a rose from each tree. In the winter, Snow White lit the fire and hung the kettle on the hob. What is a hob? The kettle was made of brass and shone like gold. So brightly was it polished. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, the mother said, Go, Snow White, and bolt the door. And then they sat around the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles and read aloud out of a large book. And the two girls listened as they sat and spun. And close by them lay a lamb on the floor, and behind them, upon a perch, sat a white dove with its head hidden beneath its wings. One evening, as they were thus sitting comfortably together, someone knocked at the door, and if he wished to be let in, the mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door. It must be a traveler who is seeking shelter. Rose Red went, pushed back the bolt, thinking that it was a poor man, but it was not. It was a bear that stretched his broad black head within the door. Rose Red screamed and sprang back. The lamb bleated, the dove fluttered, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. Do not be afraid. I will do you no harm. I am half frozen and only wanted to warm myself a little beside you. So they both came out, and by and by, the lamb and dove came near, and were not afraid of him. The bear said, You children, knock the sad snow out of my coat a little bit. So they brought the root broom, and swept the bear's hide clean, and stretched himself by the fire, and growled contently and comfortably. Too rough, he called out. Leave me alive, children. Snow White, Rose Red, will you beat your wooer dead? When it was bedtime, and the others went to bed, the mother said to the bear, As soon as day dawned, the two children let him out, and he trotted across the snow into the forest. Henceforth, the bear came every evening at the same time, laid himself down by the hearth, and let the children amuse themselves with him as much as they liked, and they got so used to him that the doors were never fastened. spring had come, and all outside was green. The bear said one morning to Snow White, Now I must go away, and cannot come back for the whole summer. 
Where are you going then, dear bear, said Snow White. I must go into the forest and guard my treasures from the wicked dwarves. In the winter, when the earth is frozen hard, they are obligated to stay below and cannot work their way through. But now, when the sun is thawed and warmed the earth, they break through it and come to pry and steal. And what once gets in their hands and in their cares does not easily see daylight again. Snow White was quite sorry at his departure as she unbolted the door for him and the bear was hurrying out. He caught against the bolt and the piece of his hairy tor a coat was torn off and it seemed to Snow White as if she had seen gold shining through it. But she was not sure about it. The bear ran away quickly and was soon out of sight behind the trees. A short time afterward, the mother sent her children into the forest to get firewood. There they found a big tree, which lay felled on the ground, and close by the trunk was something jumping back and forwards in the grass, but they could not make out what it was. When they came nearer, they saw it. was caught in the crevice of the tree, and the little fellow was jumping around like a dog tied to a rope, and did not know what to do. He glared at the girls with his fierce red eyes and cried, Why do you stand there? Can you not come here and help me? What are you up to, little man? said Rose Red. You stupid, prying goose, answered the dwarf. I was, going, I was going to split the tree and get a little wood for cooking. The little bit of food that we people get is immediately burnt up in heavy logs. We do not swallow so much as you coarse, greedy folk. I had just driven the quench safely in. first wedge was too smooth and suddenly sprang out, and the tree closed so quickly that I could not pull out my beautiful white beard. So now it is tight, and I cannot get away, and the silly, sleek, milk-faced things laugh. As the dwarf felt himself free, he laid hold of the bag which lay amongst the roots of the tree, and which was full of gold, lifted it up, grumbling to himself. Uncouth people, to cut off a fine beard. Bad luck to you. And then he swung the bag over his back, and went off, without even once looking at the children. Sometime afterward, Snow White and Rose Red went on to catch a dish of fish. As they came near the brook, they saw something like a, cra a large grasshopper jumping towards the water, as if it were going to leap in. They ran to it and found out it was the dwarf. Where are you going? said Rose Red. You surely. 
I am not such a fool, cried the dwarf. Don't you see that this accursed fish wants to pull me in? The little man had been sitting there fishing, and unluckily the wind had tangled up his beard with the fishing line. A moment later, a big fish made a bite, and the feeble creature had not the strength to pull it out. The fish kept the upper hand and pulled the dwarf towards him. He held on to all the reeds and rushes. For he was forced to follow the movements of the fish, and there was an urgent danger of being dragged into the water. The girls came just in time. They held him fast and tried to free his beard from the line, but all in vain. Beard and line were entangled fast together. There was nothing to do but bring out the scissors and cut the beard whereby a small part of it was lost again. When the dwarf saw that, he screamed out, Is that civil, you toadstool, to disfigure a man's face? Was it not enough to clip off the end of my beard? Now you have cut off the best part of it. I cannot let myself be seen by my people. I wish you had been made to run the souls off shoes. Then he took out a sack of pearls, which lay in the rushes, and without a word, he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. This happened that soon afterwards the mother sent the two children to the town to buy needles and thread and laces and ribbons. The road led them across the heath upon which huge pieces of rock lay strewn about. There, they noticed a large bird hovering in the air, flying slowly around, around, above them. It sank lower and lower, and at last settled near a rock not far away. Immediately, they heard a loud, piteous cry. They ran up and saw the horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance, 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 the looked the dwarf, and was going to carry him off. The children, full of pity, at once took tight hold of the little man and pulled against the eagle so long that at last he let his, his booty go. As soon as the dwarf had recovered from his first fright, he cried with a shrill voice, Could you not have done it more carefully? You dragged in that brown coat that is all torn and full of holes. You clumsy creatures. Then he took up a sack, a full of precious stones, and slipped away under the rock into his hole. The girls who by this time were used to his ingratitude, went on their way and did their business in town. As they crossed the heath again on their way home, they surprised the dwarf, who had emptied out his bag of precious stones in a clean spot, and had not thought that anyone would come there so late. The evening sun shone upon the bright stones. They glittered. They sparkled. With all so beautifully that the children stood still and stared at them. Why do you stand escaping there? cried the wolf, and his ashen gray face became copper red with rage. He was still cursing when a loud growling was heard, and a bear came trotting towards them out of the forest. The dwarf sprang up in fright, but he could not reach his cave for the bear was already close. Then, in the dread of his heart, he cried, Dear Mr. Bear, spare me. I will give you all my treasures. Look, the beautiful jet jewels lie there. Grant me my life. What do you want with the, such a slender little fellow as I? 
no heed of his words, but gave the wicked creature a single blow with his paw. girls had run away, but the bear called to them, Snow White, Red Rose, do not be afraid. Wait, I will come with you. Then he recognized his voice and waited. When he came up to them, suddenly his bear skin fell off, and he stood there as a handsome one man, clothed all in gold. forest as a savage bear until I was freed by his death. Now he has gotten his well-deserved punishment. Time skip. Snow White was married to him and Rose Red to his brother, and they divided between them the great treasure which the dwarf had gathered together. and happily with her children for many years. She took the two rose trees with her, and they stood before her window, and every year bore the most beautiful roses, white and red. The end. The Seven Ravens. Let me just uh, get some water real quick. Give me one second. The Seven Ravens There was once a man who had seven sons, and last of all, one daughter. Although the little girl was very pretty, she was so weak and small that they could not that they thought that she could not live, but they said she should at once be christened. So the father sent one of his friends in haste to the spring to get some water. But the other six ran with him. Each wanted to be first at drawing the water, so they were in a hurry that all let their pitchers fall into the well, and they stood very foolishly looking at another, and did not know what to do, for none dared to go home. In the meantime, the father was uneasy and could not tell what made the young men stay so long. Surely, he said, the whole seven must have forgotten themselves over some game of play. And when he had waited still longer, and they had yet did not come, he flew into a rage and wished them all turn. Had he spoken those words when he heard a croaking over his head, and looked up as seven ravens as black as coal. Sorry as he was to see his wish fulfilled, he did not know what was done could be undone, and comforted himself as well as he could for the loss of his seven sons with his dear little daughter, who soon became stronger in every day, 
more beautiful. Sorry, that's my chair sounding. Sorry, guys. <laughs> For a long time, she did not know that she had ever had any brothers. For her father and mother took care not to speak of them before her. But one day, by chance, she heard the people about her speak of them. Yes, they said. She is beautiful indeed. But still, it is a pity that her brothers should have been lost for her sake. So then she was much grieved and went to her father and mother and asked if she had any brothers. So they dared no longer hide the truth from her, but said it was the will of heaven, and that her birth was only the innocent cause of it. But the little girl mourned sadly about it every day, and thought herself the bound to do all she could to bring her brothers back. As she had neither rest nor ease, till at length one day she stole. She took nothing with her but a little ring that her father and mother had given her, a loaf of bread in case she should be hungry, a little pitcher of water in case she should be thirsty, and a little stool to rest upon when she should be weary. Thus she went on and on and journeyed till she came to the world's end. Then when she came to the sun, the sun So she ran away quickly to the moon, but the moon was cold and chilly, and said, I smell flesh and blood this way. So she ran quickly to the moon. I skipped the line. So she took herself away in a hurry, and came to the stars, and the stars were friendly and kind to her, and each star sat upon his own little stool. star rose up and gave her a little piece of wood and said, If you have not this little piece of wood, you cannot unlock the castle that stands on the glass mountain, and there your brothers live. The little girl took the piece of wood, rolled it up in a little cloth, and went again until she came to the glass mountain and found the door shut. There she felt for a little piece of wood, but when she came to unwrap the cloth, it was not there. And saw she had lost a gift of the good stars. What was to be done? She wanted to save her brothers, but had no key to the castle of the glass mountain. So this faithful little sister took a knife out of her pocket and cut off her little finger. That was just the size of the piece of wood she had lost. And put it in the door and opened it. As she went in, the little dwarf came up to her and said, Why are you seek what are you seeking for? I seek for my brothers, the little ra the seven ravens, answered she. Then the dwarf said, My masters are not at home, but if you will wait until they come, pray step in. Now the little dwarf was getting their dinner part ready, and he brought their food upon seven little plates, and their drink in seven little glasses, and set them upon a table, and out of each little plate the sister ate a small piece, and out of each little glass she drank a small drop, but she let the ring that she brought with her 
fall into the last glass. On a sudden, she heard a fluttering and croaking in the air, and the dwarf said, Here comes my masters. When they came in, they wanted to eat and drink, and look for the little plates and glasses, and said one after another, seventh came to the bottom of the glass and found the ring, he looked at it and knew that it was his father's and mother's and said, Oh, that our little sister would but come and we should be free. When the little girl heard this, for she stood behind the door all the time and listened, she ran forward and in an instant all the ravens took their right form again, and all hugged, kissed each other, and went merrily, merrily home. The End story. This last story for tonight's stream is called The Valiant Little Tailor. I believe that this one is the long, um, it's not too long, but it's one of the longer ones. However, this one is going to be a little bit special because Noir Vesper recommended this one to us. So we're going to be reading The Valiant Little Tailor upon his suggestion. So let us begin. Shall we begin? The last story for tonight. The Valiant Little Tailor. One summer's morning, a little tailor was sitting on his table by the window. He was against spirits and sued, sued with all his might. Then came a peasant woman down the street crying. Good jams. Cheap. Good jams. Cheap. This rang pleasantly in the tailor's ears. He stretched his delicate head out of the window and called. Come up here, dear woman. Here you will get rid of your goods. The woman came up the three steps to the tailor with her heavy basket, and he made her unpack all the pots for him. He inspected each one, lifted it up, put his nose to it, and at length said, The jam seems good to me, so weigh me out four ounces, dear woman, and if it is a quarter of a pound, that is of no consequence. The woman, who had hoped to find a good sale, gave him what he desired, but went away quite angrily and grumbling. Now this jam shall be blessed by God, cried the little tailor, and give me health and strength. So 
he brought the bread out of the cupboard, cut himself a piece right along the loaf, and spread the jam over it. This won't taste bitter, said he, but I will finish the jacket before I take a bite. He laid the bread near him, sewed on, and in his joy made bigger and bigger stitches. In the meantime, the smell of the sweet jam rose to where the flies were sitting in great numbers. on them. When he drew it away and counted, there lay before him no fewer than seven dead and with their legs stretched out. Are you a fellow of that sort, he said, and could not help admire his own bravery. to cut himself a girdle, stitched it, and embroidered on it in large letters. Seven at one stroke. What the town, he continued, the whole world shall hear of it. And his heart wagged with joy like a lamb's tail. The, ta the tailor put on the girdle and resolved to go forth into the world, because he thought his workshop was too small for his valor. Before he went away, he sought about in those in the house to see if there was anything which he could take with him. However, he found nothing but an old cheese that he put into his pocket. In front of the door, he observed a bird which had caught itself in a thicket. It had to go in its pocket with the cheese, sticky cheese. Now he took to the road boldly, and as he was light and nimble, he felt no fatigue. The road led him up a mountain, and when he, when he reached the highest point of it, there sound sat a powerful giant looking peacefully at him. The little went bravely up, and spoke to him, and said, Good day, comrade. So you are sitting there overlooking the wide spread world. I am just on my way thither, and want to try my luck. Have you any inclination to go with me? The giant looked contemptuously at the tailor, and said, You ragamuffin, you miserable creature. Oh, indeed, answered the little tailor, and unbuttoned his coat, and showed the giant the girdle. He wished to try him first, and took a stone in his hand, and squeezed it together, so water dropped out of it. Do that likewise, said the giant, if you have strength. 
his hand into his pocket, brought out the soft cheese, and pressed it until the liquid ran out of it. Faith, said he. That was a little better, wasn't it? The giant did not know what to say, and could not believe it of the little man. Then the giant picked up a stone and threw it so high that I could scarcely follow it. Now, little might of a man, do that likewise. Well thrown, said the tailor. But after all, the stone came down to earth again. I will throw you one which shall never come back. And he put his hand into his pocket, took out the br- eh? Is there a BGM? Eh? Okay, I thought that was a BGM, sorry about that guys. <laughs> it should just be the, the rain sound, so, mm, okay. Well thrown, said the tailor. But after all, the stone came down to earth again. Thank you guys. I will throw you one which shall never come back at all. And he put his hand into his pocket, took out the bird, and threw it into the air. The bird, delighted with his liberty, rose, flew away. He took the little tailor to a mighty oak tree, which laid there felled on the ground, and said, If you are strong enough, help me to carry the tree out of the forest. Readily, answered the little man, take you the trunk on your shoulders, and I will raise up the branches and twigs. After all, they are the heaviest. The giant took the trunk on his shoulder, but the tailor seated himself on a branch, and the giant, who could not look around, had to carry away the whole tree. And the little tailor into the bargain. He behind was quite merry and happy, and whistled the song. I shall have let to let the tree fall. The tailor sprang nimbly down, seized the tree with both arms, as if he had been carrying it, and said to the giants, You are such a great fellow, and yet cannot even carry the tree. They went on again, together, and they had passed a cherry tree. The giant laid hold of the top of the tree, where the ripest fruit was hanging, bent down, gave it to the tailor's hand, and bade him to eat. But the little tailor was much too weak to hold the tree, and when the giant let it go, it sprang back again, and the tailor was tossed into the air with it. When he had fallen down again without injury, the giant said, What is this? Have you not strength enough to hold the wicked twig? There is no lack of strength, answered the little tailor. Do you think that could be anything to a man who has struck down seven at one blow? I
giant made the attempt, but he could not get over the tree and remained hanging in the branches. So that in this, also, the tailor kept the upper hand. This is quite the story. The giant said, If you're quite, if you're such a valiant. The little tailor was willing, and followed him. When they came into the cave, other giants were sitting by the fire, and each of them had a roasted sheep in his hand, and was eating it. The little tailor looked round and thought, It is much more spacious here than in my workshop. The giant showed him a bed, and he was to lie down in it and sleep. The bed, however, was too big for the little tailor. He did not lie down in it, but crept into a corner. When it was midnight, and the giant thought that the little tailor was lying in a sound sleep, he got up, took a great iron bar, cut through the bed with one blow, and thought he had finished off the grasshopper for good. With the earliest dawn, giants went into the forest and had quite forgotten the little tailor when all at once he walked up to them quite merrily and boldly the giants were terrified they were afraid that he would strike them all dead and ran away in a great hurry the little tailor went onwards always following his always his own pointed nose after he had walked a lot for a long time. He came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and as he felt weary, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. Whilst he lay there, the people came and inspected him on all sides, and read on his girdle. them to the king, and gave it as their opinion that if war should break out, this would be a weighty and useful man who ought on no account to be allowed to depart. The council pleased the king, and he said one, he sent one of his courtiers to the little tailor to offer him military service when he awoke. The ambassador remained standing by the sleeper waited till he stretched his limbs and opened his eyes and conveyed to him this proposal. For this very reason have I come here, the tailor replied. I am ready to enter the king's service. He was therefore honorably received, and a special dwelling was assigned to him. to a decision, betook themselves in a body to the king and begged for their dismissal. We are not prepared, they said, to stay with a man who kills seven at one stroke. The king was sorry that for the sake of one he should lose all his faithful servants, wished that he had never set eyes on the tailor and would li willingly have been rid of him again. But he did not venture to give him his dismissal, for he dreaded lest he should strike him and all his people dead, and place himself on the royal throne. He thought about it for a long time, 
and at last found good counsel. He sent to the little tailor, and caused him to be informed that he was a great warrior. He had one request to make to him. In a forest of his country lived two giants, who caused a great mischief with their robbing, murdering, ravaging, and burning. And no one could approach them without putting themselves in danger of death. If the tailor conquered and killed these two giants, he would give him his only daughter to his... He would give him his only daughter to wife and half of his kingdom as a dowry. Likewise, one hundred horsemen should go with him to assist him. horsemen followed him. When he came to the outskirts of the forest, he said to his followers, Just stay waiting here. I alone will soon finish off the giants. Then he bounded onto the forest and looked about right and left. After a while, he perceived both giants. They lay sleeping under a tree and snored, so the branches waved up and down. The little tailor, not idle, gathered two pockets full of stones, and with these climbed up the tree. When he was halfway up, he slipped down by a branch, and until he sat just above the sleepers, and then let one stone after another fall on the breast of one of the giants. For a long time the giant said nothing, but at last he awoke, pushed his comrade and said, Why are you knocking at me? You must be dreaming, said the other. I am not knocking at you. They laid themselves down to sleep again, and when the little tailor I missed this part and then the little tailor threw a stone down on the second. What is the meaning of this? cried the other. Why are you pelting me? I'm not pelting you, said the first, growling. They disputed about it for a time, but as they were wary, they let the matter rest and their eyes closed once more. And the little tailor began his game again, and picked out the biggest stone, and threw it with all his might on the breast of the first giant. That is too bad, cried he, and sprang up like a madman, and pushed his companion. The other paid him back in the same coin, and they got into such a rage that they tore up the trees and belabored each other so long that they at last both fell dead on the ground at the same time. Then the little tailor leapt down. It is a lucky thing, he said he. He drew a sword and gave each of them a couple thrusts in the breast, and then went out to the horsemen and said, The work is done. I have finished both of them off, but it was hard work. They tore up the trees in their sore need and defended themselves with it. But all that is to no purpose when a man like myself comes who can kill seven.
the horsemen would not believe him and rode into the forest. There they found the giants swimming in their own blood. And all around, about to lay the torn up trees. The little tailor demanded of the king the promised reward. He, however, repented of his promise, and again bethought himself how he could get rid of the hero. Before you receive my daughter and the half of my kingdom, said he to him, you must perform one more heroic deed in the forest realms of your court, which does great harm, and you must capture it. I fear one unicorn still less than two giants. Seven took a rope and axe with him, went forth into the forest, and again bade those who were sent with him to wait outside. He had not long to seek. The unicorn soon came towards him and rushed directly on the tailor, as if it would gore him with all its horn. stood still and waited until the animal was quite close and sprang nimbly behind the tree. The unicorn ran against the tree with all of its might and struck its horn so fast into the trunk that it had not the strength to draw it out again and thus it was caught. With his axe, he hewed the horn out of the tree, and when all was ready, he led the beast away and took it to the king. The king still would not give him the promised reward, and made a third demand. Before the wedding, the tailor was to catch him a wild boar, which had made great havoc in the forest, and the huntsmen should give him their help. child's play. He did not take the huntsmen with them to the forest, and they were well pleased that he had not, for the wild boar had several times received them in such a manner that they had no inclination to lie in wait for him. When the boar perceived The boar ran after him, but the tailor ran round outside and shut the door behind it. And then the raging beast, which was much too heavy and awkward to leap out of the window, was caught. The little tailor called the huntsmen thither, that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes. The hero, however, went to the king, who is now, whether he liked it or not, obliged to keep his promise, and gave his daughter in half of his kingdom. Had he known that it was no warlike hero, but a little tailor who was standing before him, it would have gone to his heart still more than it did. The wedding was held with great magnificence and small joy, and out of a tailor a king was made. After some time, the young queen heard her husband say in his dreams at night, Boy, make me a doublet and patch the pantaloons, or else I will wrap the yard measure over your ears. Then she discovered in what state of life the young lord had been born, and next morning complained of her wrongs to her father. Husband, who was nothing else 
afterwards, he went to his bed with his wife at the usual time. And when she thought that he had fallen asleep, she got up. over your ears. I smote seven at one blow. I killed two giants. I brought away one unicorn and caught a wild boar. And I to fear those who were standing outside this room. When the men heard the tailor speaking thus, they were overcome by a great dread, and ran as if the wild huntsmen were behind them, and none of them would venture anything further against him. So the little tailor was, and remained the king to the end of his life. The everyone has a wonderful night. Sleep well, take care, and hope you guys relax, okay?